Hello folks, what we have for review today is the quite delightful Caliber Wings uh, Red 31 Tomcatsky 172nd scale model. I'll take a moment here to thank you for watching this video and feel free to indicate a like or even subscribe if you like the content on this channel. So. Uh, let's get to the subject at hand, which is this lovely little F-14 model right here. So the F-14 in question is kind of a famous airplane, so if some of the details I talk to are already known to you, feel free to fast forward as you feel the need to do so. Um, the first thing we're going to talk about is some of the basics on it, which is the model. Obviously, it's the F-14A Tomcat. Um, this is signed to the VF-126, um, which is a detail I'll touch on later because there is a minor inaccuracy regarding the promotion of this model versus what it was actually assigned to do. Um, so the good thing is uh, it's very detailed. Uh, Caliber Wings has done a very good job of modeling this aircraft and configuring it so and it can be displayed in either the ground position which is what you see in front of you and it can be displayed in flight. Do note however that if you do decide to display this aircraft in flight you will need to purchase a separate stand. I believe Caliber Wings sells those independently at this point. I believe the price for those is about $30 shipped. Um, so do bear in mind that might be different when you get around to watching this video. So those are the prices at the time of filming, which is fall of 2020. So it is a limited edition, apparently. Um, it is, this example is number 267 out of 1600. So I imagine once they have sold out of all 1600 that they will not produce any more in this color. So, um, so let's get to the discussion of the model itself. Now the pro, like the pro side of the column here, it is, as I said, very detailed, and as you see in front of you, there are a lot of configuration options you can do with this aircraft. You can show it with um, four Phoenixes, which kind of surprised me because the aircraft this is modeled after was assigned to a fleet replacement squadron acting as an aggressor unit for the Navy. So. I don't believe they would have carried Phoenixes in a real life situation. However, um, maybe for some training purposes, they included Phoenixes as part of their, um, you know, some of their training evolutions. But anyways, um, you can configure this aircraft to show Phoenixes on all four stations on the bottom if you are so inclined. You can also show it with um, just the aim sevens on the center pylon to do that you'll have to take the fairings off which for this particular video I have installed on the aircraft so um, with uh, the options in front of you you can uh, show this aircraft in basically any configuration that they were realistically set up as um, I do want to point out something real special here which is that the pylons are specific and accurately modeled to the missiles. What some may not realize is that the pylons for the Phoenix missiles on the uh, underside of the wing gloves, those are specific to the AIM-54s. And the reason is the Phoenix missile is heavier. The Phoenix missile also has a um, some different aerodynamic properties. So that's where the Phoenixes use a longer pylon for uh, use instead of the uh, shorter pylons you see being used on the AIM-7s as are configured on this aircraft. So do bear that in mind when you're out model shopping that if you see an F-14 with the AIM-54s on some of the short pylons, that's not an accurately modeled setup. So for the purposes of accurately modeling the AIM-54s, uh, Caliber Wings has done a very good job of making sure that the correct pylons are included with this kit. So the cockpit detail is very nice. Um, the uh, missile detail even includes the serial number. So if you look at the AIM-54s in the foreground, 
Each of them has a model and serial number stamped on the side, which is a very good level of detail, in my opinion. You also have the option to show uh, different engine nozzle configurations, which is really good because uh, some may, may realize this, some may not. When the F-14 is powered down because of the configuration of the hydraulic system and the weight on um, wheel switches, the pylons, or excuse me, the engine nozzles will actually show different statuses um, when you look at the aircraft, meaning when you look at the back of a powered down F-14, you will sometimes notice that the uh, left engine, if you look from back to front, will have a closed engine nozzle and the right engine will have an open engine nozzle. Uh, and this is again due to the behavior of the hydraulic system and the weight on wheel switch when you power down uh, one engine and then the other one. So um, it's nice to see that Caliber Wings has incorporated the ability to change the pipe, the, I keep saying pylons, they're um, to change the engine nozzles. So this way you can display the aircraft accurately on the ground with the asymmetrical engine nozzle configuration, which is again, a wonderful, wonderful detail change uh, that Caliber Wings has taken notice of here. You also will see that there are block off plates for the engines. So those little red things that you see down there can be put into the, uh, the four intakes and those keep, you know, um, foreign objects and animals and whatever out of the engines. So when it's time to fly the airplane, you don't risk damaging the engine. And of course you have a couple of fuel tanks and then some blue painted sidewinders and the blue, in case for those who don't realize it, um, the blue markings signify training rounds because obviously you don't want to get into a mock dogfight and accidentally fire an actual missile at somebody. That would be a very expensive and unpleasant way to end your training flight. So um, now let's talk about some of the cons. Um, there's a few and they're not serious, but there are some things that do need to be mentioned here. The first is the, uh, now Caliber Wings has done a good job of modeling the speed brakes and the tail hook. However, the fit of those parts is somewhat loose. So if you want to display the aircraft with those parts in the closed configuration, you may need to put a little bit of, uh, kind of some Elmer's glue on those parts. Make sure that the components stay in the closed position when you are placing the model because otherwise uh, the speed brakes and tail hook will have a habit of coming uh, open. You know, the tail hook will come down and the speed brakes will show as open. And uh, it is something to be just aware of when you're handling the model. The other thing to note too is, and I guess this is just kind of a what happens when you have so many potential configuration options. Um, Caliber Wings has obviously done a really good job of including multiple configurations with this kit. However, um, uh, it does need to be said that the fit is not perfect. Um, with some of the pylons and some of the missile combinations, you may find that the fit is either extremely stiff um, you don't have to like break anything or sand anything down, but it is a little stiff with mounting some of the missiles to some of the pylons. And you may also find that the fit could be loose. Um, I know the pylon for the left side of the aircraft here, it's a bit loose. I may need to put some, uh, some white glue on that to kind of keep it attached because it, if I just look at it funny, it just wants to come off the airplane. So. Um, the right side one seems to stay on by itself just fine. So you may find that the example you purchased might not have those issues, or you may find the fitment of all the pylons loose. So just kind of bear that in mind when you're handling the model. It's not a big deal. It is something, however, to be aware of. So you don't accidentally break something or send it back into fit because you know it, you don't know if it's actually broken or not, right? So. Um, the last thing that I'm going to speak to, and this is more of a, I guess some might call it trivia, some might call it history um, detail, and therefore some people may not care, but um, being a veteran, this is just something that I, I do have to mention. I feel almost compelled to mention here. Um, 
So this aircraft is marketed by Caliber Wings as being part of Top Gun, which is not technically accurate because it was assigned to VF-126, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video. So technically speaking, this aircraft is not assigned to the Top Gun unit. It is assigned to Miramar under VF-126, which is a Navy aggressor squadron. So to kind of go into some detail about the distinction, aggressor squadrons will obviously work with some of the institutions like say the Naval Fighter Weapons School, aka Top Gun. In the Air Force side, aggressor squadrons will work with the U.S. Air Force Fighter Weapons Schools. However, um, the aggressor squadrons are not necessarily assigned to those schools. Um, and this does get a bit confusing, um, especially if you're not in the military or not kind of familiar with how some of the chains of command can work. But essentially you can have a aggressor squadron that is assigned to Top Gun or is assigned to the Fighter Weapons School, and you can have aggressor squadrons which aren't. Um, they're still aggressor squadrons, they still do the job of simulating you know, opposing forces, tactics, and whatnot, however, they're just their own aggressor squadrons. They're not directly affiliated with um, the fighter weapon schools. And this is done by design because um, you, know, you can't just have one aggressor squadron in one part of the world because what do you do for the squadrons that are you know, outside of the United States? Uh, how do you keep those people up to speed on their training and their tactics when they are on the other side of the world, right? Um, it's one of the reasons why there is such a thing as Top Gun or U.S. Air Force Fighter Weapons Schools because these schools, and it has to be mentioned, these squadrons are schools, their job is to teach people who then teach other pilots how to fly and fight effectively uh, because there's just no way you can channel 20,000 aviators in a given uh, branch of service through one school in any kind of reasonable time. It's just not logistically feasible. So um, you can have aggressor squadrons which are not necessarily assigned to a specific um, command like Top Gun. And from what I can tell, VF-126 was not directly assigned to Top Gun. It was uh, stationed at Miramar. So they shared space and there is a really good photo that is included in the box when you open it um, of this aircraft on the ramp at Miramar. I believe you can also Google it too. I think it's the same picture. And it's really nice. Um, so while this aircraft is connected to Top Gun, um, it is not assigned to Top Gun. So it is something that needs to be remembered because someone might misspeak and say, well, this aircraft was you know, assigned to the Top Gun at a certain period of time. And that's not technically correct. So being a veteran, that's just something that I care about. Maybe it's something that other modelers may not even really, you know, you know worry about. But it is a detail that I felt was worth mentioning uh, because, again, someone might get the wrong impression that this aircraft served in the Top Gun unit specifically, and that is, of course, not the case. So, um, so now we get to the fun part, I guess, um, which is kind of talking about some of the history because every aircraft has its own story right and when you have a model of an aircraft i think it's worth not only sharing the details of the model but also why this aircraft exists i mean why is it that the u.s navy decided to paint this aircraft to look just like a russian like su-27 flanker why, why is that even a thing um so the, to begin with honestly I feel like inclined to say that I should also talk to the history of the F-14. However, that honestly is a video in and of itself. Um, and I, I kind of did some research initially to kind of see if I could boil down um, a discussion of the F-14 and kind of just like talking about the background of this aircraft. And I gave up because there's just too much. There's too much history. Um, the TFX, how the F-14 came to be, and the whole legend and the history and the documentation behind that, it, it's a rabbit hole, honestly. And 
I could probably make a video just on the TFX competition by itself because there's a lot of information out there about how the F-14 came to be, which is on further research, turned out to be kind of just, um, kind of doesn't really match the, the documented truth. Um, people tend to say that the F-14 was created because the F-111 didn't pass the carrier trials, which is actually not true. The F-111 B, the Navy version, did pass its carrier trials. So um, the other thing that others have said is, well, you know, the F-14 can't can dogfight and the F-111 can't, which makes sense because the F-111 from the Navy was never intended to dogfight in the first place. And to explain that further means talking about the politics of the F-111, Robert McNamara's involvement, um, the various committees that selected the design, and then Robert McNamara overrode them, and why the Navy didn't want to buy the airplane even before the airplane was actually done, and the politics between the F-14's creation and how like Grumman basically almost bankrupted themselves making this aircraft before the Navy even got enough money to approve it. Yeah, it's a very long story, and honestly, it's a, it's a story that really deserves its own video to do it justice. And I'd have to bring the F-111 into the discussion because that aircraft has had a, I believe, this is just me, but I'm just one veteran aviation geek, but I think that the F-111's reputation has been unfairly maligned over the years. Um, it's been a successful aircraft, but you wouldn't know that because of some of the things that people have said about it, especially in comparison to this aircraft, the F-14. So instead of going down that very long, huge tangent and being on this video for you know, three hours discussing all that, um, I'm just going to say that the F-14 is a relatively popular airplane. It was designed to uh, basically act as a Navy air superiority aircraft, and it did that job from the mid-1970s all the way up to 2006 when it was retired for probably some well-documented reasons. Now, again, uh, this is stepping into some very deep aviation lore and notice I didn't mention a certain popular movie that came out in the mid 80s featuring the F-14 and involving Top Gun. Um, there's definitely a lot of material out there about that if you want to check it out. Um, but I do want to touch on why this aircraft was retired a little bit before I wrap up this review because I think people tend to think that uh, you know the F-14 was retired before its time. Um, but I do have some numbers here, and basically the, the F-14, when it was retired in 2006, had a um, maintenance requirement of about 55 flight hours, or 55 man hours of maintenance, excuse me, for every hour it spent in the air. Now, some of you might be, you know, sitting down in shock, and some of you might be like, why, why does that matter? Well. Um, here's why it matters. <laughs> uh, so if you think about the cost of a typical aviation maintainer, um, the average cost per hour to maintain an airplane, like your typical propeller civilian airplane, is about $60 an hour. Okay, so if your Cessna 172 needs two hours of work done on it, it's going to cost about $120. All right, so at $60 of maintenance cost per hour, and if we multiply that against the 55 hours of maintenance each Tomcat required for every hour it's spent in the air, to keep an F-14 in the air for one hour in 2006 at $60 per man hour of, of maintenance cost, the Navy would be spending basically about $3,300 an hour to fly an F-14. So on a 12 hour uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom mission, uh, which can involve air cover or armed escort or close air support, which was usually the mission that they flew at that point, um, one 12 hour mission would set back the Navy about $39,600 in maintenance costs alone. That's not including the fuel, that's not including ordnance, that's not including the other costs that are involved with operating the airplane, the Navy, aka your citizen tax dollars, would be billed to the tune of almost $40,000 to fly one F-14 on a mission. 
Now remember, the Navy does not fly airplanes by themselves. So two F-14s on one mission, you're talking $80,000 per mission for two airplanes, um, which is just an insane maintenance cost. And that's just the financials. Like that's not looking at how many six, or not 16, they don't join that young, but like 18, 19, 20, 21 year old kids who are toiling, you know, for, for hours and hours and hours to keep their airplanes running. Um, one F-14 squadron commander actually got in trouble for saying this. Um, he was quoted during, I believe, either the workup to Operation Iraqi Freedom or afterward. But he was quoted as saying that he had had two goals in his life. And one was to own a junkyard and the other was to fly fighter jets, and the Navy gave him a chance to do both in commanding an F-14 squadron at that point. So clearly the maintenance situation and the cost of that was just insane for the Navy to bear. And when the Navy is spending you know, $40,000 per mission just to keep an F-14 flying, and the comparative cost of a Super Hornet is literally one-fifth of that, um, you know, you don't need an actuarian degree to see where this is going. So whatever political accusations might have been said or discussions or you know, whatever others may think, um, the practical matter is the F-14 definitely, there were some grounds to retire. And, and that's not even getting into the, like the next generation of aircraft and how you know, electronic attack and low observability and those kind of things are more and more important in the modern war fighting environment, especially for peer-to-peer -peer enemies. Um, you had uh, like Rios and these aircraft in 2006, literally pulling circuit breakers by hand to keep the airplane mission functioning when things didn't work on the flight. So, I mean, you got an F-14 where you got some guy yanking switches <laughs> to keep the electronics going. And we're going up against countries that now, you know, in 2020, um, have their own stealth platforms, have their own electronic attack and, you know, um, network centric air, you know, dominance operations and things like that. So um, with all those changes that have happened to air power and the prevalence of drones too, I mean, I'd like to say the F-14 should have a place in the modern military, but honestly, when the aircraft was retired in 2006, um, there, there were some sound reasons to do that. And I think time has clearly shown that, you know, as much of a fan as I am of this aircraft from the, you know, connoisseur, the aviation geek's perspective, um, from the practical war fighting side of the desk, to me, there's no, no question uh, going with the Super Hornet at that time was the right decision to take. So, um, with all that stated, uh, I think this is a quality model, and um, I do want to say it before wrapping this video up that um, at the time of this video, the cost of this is about one hundred and fifty-six dollars. So, I don't. I was going to categorize this as a negative, but on second thought, I think it's just important that we just kind of throw that out there. That yes, this is not going to be one of the more affordable F-14 Tomcat models out there. Um, but I do believe that in the diecast 172 world, this is a leading option. And if you're on the fence between this and another model, um, I, I think you, you really could, um, it's a good choice to go with. Um, I, there are, there is like a Century Wings model that I'll compare this to later, which I think might be a little bit more kind of detailed if, if this is like if this is like 90% to 100 then I think maybe the century wings might be like a 94% to 100 in terms of quality um, with 100 being the best of course um, but in the scheme of things is that worth the extra money to get a century wings over this the caliber wings model that's really a tough question to ask some people might demand that extra detail some might not we'll see uh, so that's something that i'll probably do in a later on video um, but 
thank you for watching to this point. Um, I do welcome your feedback. Please leave your questions and, and thoughts below. Um, you know, what do you think? Um, was the Tomcat retired too early? Uh, do you think that the F-14 has a place in the 21st century world of aviation and tactical um, aerial combat? Um, leave your thoughts below in the appropriate place. Once again, thank you for watching and um, have a good day.